So tonight, uh, I'm really happy to welcome back Doug Wexler. Doug is a friend of the Schuylkill Center. He's, a, he's um, presented for us on several occasions. Really appreciate it very much. Uh, he's a naturalist, a children's book author, and a photographer, an extraordinary photographer from Philadelphia. He worked at the Academy of Natural Sciences for 28 years and is the author of 28 books for kids, including The Hidden Life of a Toad, which we sell in our gift shop and features photographs taken in the region, including some taken at the Nature Center. So our toads are starring in his children's book. Doug, um, Doug, welcome. How are you? Got to get you to unmute. Oh, this. Okay, how's that? There we are. Good. Welcome. So Hi, glad everybody. you're here. Hi, it's it's good to see you all here. Thank you for coming to my house and. Uh, It'll be fun to talk about toads. Yep. And Doug, I'm going to stop sharing as you start sharing and okay. just offer that Doug's going to be talking to us for like 45 minutes or so. And then uh, when we're done with that, uh, I'll be sharing with him questions that you offer to him via chat. So get your questions ready and you can ask your chat your questions anytime during the event. So okay, take it away, Doug. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Really appreciate it. Sure thing. Okay. What's going on here? Okay, how's that? Can you see that okay? Yep. Okay, hi. Hi, everybody. It's, it's really nice to have all you attending on this. Um, I'm going to talk about toads tonight, and it's a, an appropriate time to talk about toads because they could be out any day now. In fact, um, this is the, an American toad, and it's possible because it's been so warm for the last few days and it's going to rain tomorrow. If it rains enough, the toads could come out tomorrow night. You never know. Um, so I, I think I'll start with one of the most common questions I get, which is what's the difference between a frog and a toad? And on our left here, we have three species of toads. They're all in the family family Bufonidae, the toad, true toad family. And on the right, we have three different types of frogs from three different families. So the toads um, are, more, um, excuse me, all the frogs and toads together make up a group of called an order of um, animals called anura. So most people just refer to those as frogs and toads. And the truth is, there's not really a clear cut difference between what's a frog and what's a toad. If it belongs to the true toad family, then we say, definitely say it's a toad. But there are other frogs that are called toads. So it can be very confusing. Um, but normally when we talk about toads, we're talking about the, the family of toads called Bufonidae. So Doug, if I could interrupt, you're not quite in presentation mode, so the photographs are a little smaller. Could, do you want to? Oh, really? Can you, yep. Hmm. Can you switch them to full screen? I, I, I'm seeing them full screen. Let's see what I can do here. Ah. So we see uh, the smaller slide, then we see the next slide too, and your notes. Oh, there you go. wow. Okay. Um, if you could click on, on slideshow across the top, maybe. Let me see. Slideshow. Um, no, it's not. Um, or maybe it's in view to the right. Oh. I'm not super familiar, Doug, with the platform that you're using, but I think at the very bottom. Um, it's also that one, right? At the very bottom of the screen, like there's that little toggle bar that minimizes or maximizes. And right next to that on the left, I think that should get you to full screen. I think you're right, Amit. All the way at the bottom, right? Bottom right. It says notes at the bottom. Then to the you go like a few icons to the right of notes. Oh, wait a minute. Is the full um, screen one? I might have to go back into. Let me just see something here. So Doug and I signed on early, and we had it all working perfectly. <laughs> so it was working before. I didn't. I didn't get anything different. But, uh, Okay, notes. Um, I don't, oh, there's notes. 
So all the way right and go one, go two, three, that one, that one right there. Try that one. And what do we think? Does that work? It's thinking about it. No? Huh. Uh, gee. Oh, maybe maybe this is one, two. Amanda, I thought you had it there. <laughs> yeah, I thought I did too. Is this doing anything? No. Allison says try display settings at top. Display settings. Display setting. So we, we see a lot of black around the photographs and it's yeah. Okay. And this has display settings in the middle. Show taskbar, display settings, and end slideshow at the top. Oh, there it was. We had it for a second. Well, I stopped the sharing. Now let me there try we go. It. For some reason I've got it on two screens here. There you go. Is that good? That's it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> now back to the toes here. So the <clears throat> in common parlance, the difference between a frog and a toad is the toads have typically dry skin and warty skin. Um, so we have a toad on the left and a frog on the right here. Yeah, here you can see the warty skin of the toad. It's very finicky. Uh, toads also have poison glands um, right behind the eye. It's called the parotid gland. And if they're attacked, they can exude this milky poison, which is quite toxic. If you swallowed a toad, you might not live to tell about it. Um, it's always a good idea to wash your hands after handling toads. Um, so this time of year, when um, usually the first warm rain in spring, sometime typically in late March or mid-March, uh, the toads come out um, in the first warm rain, they come out at night and they hop to the ponds where they breed, the ponds or stream sides. And, um, here's a couple of wood frogs, just to show you the, um, the toads um, have short legs and the frogs have long legs. Um, so they jump better. And the toad we have here is the, school, is the uh, American toad. This is one at Schuylkill Center, a female. And um, here you can see where American toads are found in the country. So most, most of the northeastern part of, of the continent. Now we have one other toad that at least used to be in Philadelphia. I don't know if they're still around. They're very common in Southern New Jersey. And that's the Fowler's toad. It has a blunter snout and um, <clears throat> it also has more spots um, connected in dark areas on the back, but you can't see that too well on this picture. Uh, but in Philadelphia, the only toad you're likely to see is the American toad, which is this one. And toads um, are amphibians. They tend to have moist, need to be in moist environments. They can wander around quite a bit in drier places, but as soon as they get to a wet spot, they um, kind of refill the tank, so to speak, absorb water right through their belly and um, right through the skin of the belly. So here are a couple of places where we might find toads breeding. Hollywog Pond at the Schuylkill Center, uh, the Fire Pond at the Schuylkill Center, and Cattail Pond at Schuylkill Center, and then also in a number of places along the Wissahickon. Interestingly, along the Wissahickon, uh, they tend to breed later in the season, I mean, a couple of weeks later, because it's cooler down there. And they also tend to breed in these shallow areas 
along the side of the creek, and not as much in the creek itself. Uh, in the toads spend the winter underground. They, they dig down beneath the ground, and then they come out, as I said, the first warm rains of spring. So a nice night like this, they'll come out on the sides of the skookal, as the skies of the uh, Wissahickon. <clears throat> um, and the males are the first to arrive. These are a bunch of males patrolling Polywog Pond at night. And they're, they keep swimming around. Some of them are singing. Um, the ones swimming are looking for a female. Um, so here's another male. And as soon as they arrive at the pond, they start singing. Here you can see it with its vocal sac out. And uh, here, we'll see if we can get this one to sing. Hmm. Look right over its shoulder now. Watch how it's puffing up. Um. So uh, usually it's a little bit, a couple of days after the males arrive, the females start to arrive. And as soon as one approaches the pond, there's usually a male ready to hop on top of her. And he hops on top and, and grabs her behind the front legs and rides along on top of her. This is called amplexus. And he'll ride on top of her until it's um, several hours later until it's time to mate. So um, now frogs and toads do the same thing. And here's a case where a frog kind of got confused and grabbed a toad. So this is a pickerel frog grabbing an American toad um, and hanging on, <laughs> hoping, but against hope. Um, so while they're hanging on there, here we see a male hanging on to a female with a second male trying to knock him off. So he's he's trying to get in there and mate with this female, but um, he's not having much success. And sometimes you get these toad balls, just aggregations of several males clinging on to each other and to the female in the middle of the, or the bottom of the pile here. And this can actually be quite dangerous for the females because sometimes they can drown if this goes on for too long. So there's a lot of competition for the females by the males. Now, um, when they finally settle down and ready to mate, the female releases her eggs and the male kind of forms this triangle and gets all the eggs bunched up together and fertilizes a, one bunch at a time. And after doing that, he, he'll move on, or the, the, they'll both move on. And you can see where there are little clusters of eggs. That's where he's fertilized the cluster of eggs. And then those eggs are coming out in two long strings. And as they move away, the strings stretch out. And then they, there's another cluster. And eventually, the strings plus, uh, stretch out or, or or get wrapped up into a, a tangled mess. Um, but that's these strands um, can get to be quite long, several yards long, and up to a maximum of about 12,000 eggs in, in these two strands of, of eggs. So here's what a tangled batch of, of toad eggs looks like. All the eggs are in one line in this jelly mass. So after the female lays the eggs, she goes hopping back into the woods or the gardens, wherever she has her home. And the males usually stick around quite a bit longer, hoping for another female to show up. Um, 
So let's take a look at the eggs now. Um, when they start out, the embryo is just a, a round ball. Underneath it's, it can be white and um, you can see where it's, the uh, differentiation is starting to take place. The cells are starting to divide. And then after a couple of days, they start elongating. <clears throat> and um, you can see the, the embryos are moving towards a tadpole form. Um, anywhere between three to seven days they hatch. Depends on the water temperature. And when they hatch, they're blind. They don't have a mouth that they can use and they can't swim yet. So they're just kind of hang out on top of this jelly um, for a couple days until they develop the appropriate parts. So after um, several more days, they're um, swimming. You can see they have these long gills sticking out the side of their head and um, the mouths are developed so they can eat now. You see in the lower inset picture, you can see that. Can you see the mouse here? I don't know if you can. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so eventually they, um, the gills cover over. Now here you can see that the pattern of development, um, the tadpole about three days old, and then um, several more days, the, the gills are developed to the maximum extent outside the body. And then skin starts to grow over the gills as we um, reach the older stages. And you can also see the intestine starting to coil. Um, eventually, the gills are completely covered over. And then you can see at the bottom picture on the right, this, there's a little um, protrusion there, which is like a little piece of hose. It's the exit hole for the water that comes in through the nostrils, passes over the gills, and goes out the, side of the, uh, the left side of the toad through this hole called the spiracle. And keep that in mind because that'll be important later on. Here you can see the spiracle on the lower part of the, of the picture here. So <clears throat> spiracle is the exit hole for the water that goes over the gills and brings the oxygen to the gills. Um, <clears throat> the toad tadpoles tend to form schools and they tip, typically stay in very shallow water for two reasons. They, they can avoid large fish there and also it's warmer, so they develop faster. Overall, it takes them about two months to develop into toadlets. Um, so as part of the development, the legs grow out and they start as a little tiny bud at the base of the tail. And then here you can see the, the, hand, the uh, feet just starting to differentiate with the toes. And here's a, <clears throat> a well-differentiated leg on an older tadpole. Um, now, I had never really given much thought to how the arms develop. It hadn't really occurred to me before I got interested in writing this book, my book about toads, The Hidden Life of a Toad, that um, how the arms develop. And I just kind of assumed that they would develop the way the legs do come out as a little stub and then get bigger and bigger and differentiate the hands. Well, I noticed that wasn't happening. And I noticed that some of the tadpoles that I brought in and raised um, got these lumps on the side. <clears throat> so what I did was I took, in this case, two pictures. You can see one where I put the flash on top of the toad and one where I illuminated it from the bottom. And on the bottom of the toad, you can see the arms and um, you can see the elbows there. 
um, behind the eyes on the side of the toad. And, and they're forming bulges on the skin, as you can see on the top of the picture, but they're hidden beneath the skin. And at one point, I waited and waited and waited to try to see the, the hand pop through the skin. It actually breaks right through the skin on the right side of the toad. I, I waited for hours watching this little aquarium in my basement. And then the toad swam off to the corner of the tank where I couldn't see it and swam back a few seconds later, half, half a minute later with the toad, the, the arm popped out <laughs> and I missed the shot. But here you can see it, see the whole hand beneath the skin. And um, so that's about to pop through the, pop through the skin there. So um, I don't know if that, I had never seen a picture like this in any book. So this, I put this in my children's book. You can see it's about to pop through the skin. Now on the other side, um, the toad has that spiracle and the arm actually pops right out through the spiracle. Here you can see the hand starting to come out. And then here, you can see that the whole arm is popped out through the spiracle. And this happens quickly. It's not, um, not something that happens over a long period of time. So um, now we have a, a quadruped. We have a, a animal with four legs, or four limbs, and still with a long tail. So here's a, a, a toadlet that's maybe seven weeks old. And <clears throat> it's um, getting, this is um, the period called metamorphosis, the change from one life form to another form. So from tadpole to toad or toadlet as we call the little toads. And here, metamorphosis is a really amazing thing because so many things change in the body of a toad or a frog, or, or even an insect that goes through metamorphosis. <clears throat> and so here we can see the changes in the mouth and the, a, a tadpole in the middle of its tadpole stage. The mouth has these little tiny black teeth-like things called denticles that can scrape algae off the surface of a rock. And then it starts developing a mouth. And by the time it emerges as a toadlet, or in this case, a juvenile toad, it has a fully formed mouth. Although the mouth has no teeth, um, toads don't have teeth, they swallow everything whole. And in fact, they'll eat just about anything that'll fit in their mouth that's alive. Uh, the skin goes from relatively smooth to um, a dry, warty texture. And the eye goes from flat against the surface of the tadpole to this big bulging eye sticking out on top of the, the toad's head. And all of these changes take place within a few days. So it's, it's an amazing process to watch. And again, I showed you before the coiled intestine beneath the toad, and that will straighten out in the toadlet and um, be much less coiled and shorter, relatively speaking. So the tail, interestingly, absorbs all of the, into the body. You can't really see it, watch it disappear, but slowly it disappears and all the nutrients in the tail get recycled and go towards building up the body of the toadlet. So here's a, give you good idea of the size of these toadlets when they're um, almost fully metamorphosed. You can still see some of them have stubs of toads. Sometimes um, where you've got really good toad populations, you can see these black areas at the edge of the shore, which is means almost solid toadlet <laughs> on the shore of a pond or, or stream. 
Okay, once it's lost its tail and um, hung around the edge of the pond for a few days, it hops off into the woods or into some somebody's garden and eventually settles down into a, an area where it's going to spend most of its life on land. Um, so here's one off in the woods. Um, some of them live in the woods, some in, in gardens. There's a, a juvenile toad. It takes about two years for the males to develop to adulthood and three years for the females. The females are quite a bit larger, up to four inches or so. And the males are more likely to be a couple of two or two and a half inches or so. Um, and they vary from place to place in color. So uh, this one's from central Pennsylvania. It's a little, a little more colorful than some of the toads we have here. And of course, they, um, they sometimes end up wandering off on, on our roads and very dangerous for them. Uh, here's a pair where the, a, a male actually found a female before she even got to the pond. And they're in, in the amplexus traveling along towards the pond. Now, uh, I believe it was in 2009, um, this woman, Lisa Levinson, called my wife who was working at Debbie Carr, who was working at the city parks department. She was in, in charge of environmental education there at the time. And Lisa told Debbie that there were all these toads getting killed on Port Royal Avenue next to the Schuylkill Center. So Debbie and I went to investigate and we figured they must be breeding in the Roxborough Reservoir next door, um, but nobody had really confirmed that yet. So we brought some Chinese food set up on the shore of the reservoir and waited until it got dark. And sure enough, we heard the toads calling down in the reservoir. And so Lisa set up a program called Toad Detour and she got, rounded up volunteers to help shepherd the toads across the road. And um, she got a very successful program going. She got the city to allow us to block off the roads. And after a few years, um, she handed the program over to the Schuylkill Center. And the Schuylkill Center has been managing that program for, I, I believe, the last 11 years. Um, and um, here's the toad crossing at Port Royal Avenue. So um, every year about this time, the uh, Schuylkill Center has had volunteers help to man the, the uh, toad detour and to count the toads that are crossing the road. So I believe Mike is going to tell you a little bit more about this. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop there and, and uh, take any question when Mike is ready. And um, it's um, been a real pleasure talking with you. So thank you. That's great, Doug. You're getting a lot of uh, compliments uh, in chat uh, on your photography. So thank you. Thank you. Um, to mention Toad Detour, actually the toads, uh, they have great press agents. Uh, they they <laughs> they, they've been on TV, they've been on radio, they've been in the news. They were on the front page of uh, the Wall Street Journal a few years ago. Uh, it was really extraordinary. The New York Times has done a profile of them. Um, so the toads are remarkable. Um, in fact, one of our, uh, our volunteer coordinator, Claire, who was with us for many, many years uh, coordinating Toad Detour, I believe that she's here as well. So hi, Claire. Thank you for doing this. Um, Toads also have their face on Facebook page, Toad Detour. So if you go to Facebook, go to Toad Detour, um, you can find more information about um, that program. Um, and we are gonna be doing it. Last year, we didn't know what to do because the pandemic was so new. Uh, we figured out this year, there's an online orientation that you can take. So you can see a, a video of what it means to be to help out with Toad Detour. So check that video out, go to, uh, there's a Toad Detour section of our website as well, and a Facebook page. So multiple ways for you to uh, connect with toads. But Doug, you're thinking it's gonna be soon. Yeah, I, well, 
it's possible a few toads could come out tomorrow, but I don't think the main um, exodus, the main migration to the ponds will start until a couple more weeks when it warms up a little more. Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, so let me, let me just get to some of the questions from you. Um, somebody at first said uh, she thought this was a TED talk, not a toad talk. She was <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I thought you'd like that. Um, Tracy wants to know, can you tell males from females uh, other than size? Yeah. The, um, well, during the breeding season, the males have a darker throat. And also, if you grab a male by the sides and kind of pinch him on the sides lightly, he'll start making a chirping sound. And that sound means, get off my back. I'm a male toad, not a female toad. <laughs> so that's, that's another way. But usually, you get a pretty good idea by looking at the size. Yeah. And, and when you see two together, it's really, you have no doubt who yeah. the male or female is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can a Fowler's toad mate with an American toad? It um, actually it turns out that American toads do hybridize with other species occasionally. Um, but it, their, their timing is off because the American toads tend to breed before Fowler's toads. Right. Fowler's toads tend to like sandier areas. Um, but they do overlap in range, so it's it's possible. One of the things I always enjoy about frogs and toads is that they they space out by by timing, so they each come at different times, and by the, and they have their own song, so they kind of know who each other is partly by timing and partly by song. So it cuts down on that. Ed wanted to know what tadpoles eat in the wild. I guess mostly algae. I think that's what you said, right? Uh, they eat algae. They eat all kinds of detritus, which is decaying matter. Right. Um, they're eating the, getting their nutrition from the bacteria in the de decaying matter. And they'll even eat um, things like dead fish. Just kind of scrape whatever they can get. It's kind of a combination between fish and bacteria, really. So is it unusual for an animal in the wild that the, that the diet switches so radically from one stage to the next that, so that it's, it's algae mostly eating plants and then suddenly it's a meat eater eating whatever meat he can find? Well, uh, not... I mean, not that unusual considering a lot of insects do that. Do that, right. And um, that's true. Yeah. And we do that. We switch from milk to <laughs> yogurt. There we go. That's right. <laughs> Allison grew up near the Nature Center in the 80s and 90s and doesn't recall noticing or hearing toads. Did something change that brought them to the reservoir? Huh. Um, you may not have noticed them singing because they, breeding season, at least of the toads, is pretty brief. So if you weren't out there on the right days in the end of March, beginning of April, you might not have heard them. Right. So <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, um, I'm sorry, I was, I was following up on that. So. Um, I know when, when Lisa discovered this, what she also was, she noticed that the toads also, unfortunately, tended to come out during rush hour. So it was the highest volume uh, during you know early evening that they're coming out. So they're coming out at night when it's dark and when it's raining because they, they want to keep their skin moist, right? Right. And avoid predators. Um, Is that the darkness also to avoid predators? Yeah, they're probably avoiding crows and, and other uh, diurnal predators. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, and another thing I wanted to mention was um, during breeding season, they start, the males will start calling at night. But as the season progresses, um, after a few days, they, they get really bold and they just may sing all day. So if you're hiking down on the Wissahickon uh, in the middle of April, you'll often hear the toads. Right. And I recommend doing what Doug did, which is getting some Chinese food and sitting up at the reservoir at night because the sound is extraordinary. It's it's really loud when you got them all going. It's a great it's a great sound. Beverly wants to know how long do toes live? I think a typical lifespan might be four or five, six years at most. Um, I think there are records of them living much longer, but <clears throat> um, of course. Um, you know, if a toad lays 12,000 eggs, only a few are going to make it to adulthood. And um, 
only a few of those will survive very long. So it's that's the number twelve thousand. Oh, well, that's a maximum. But yeah, that's crazy. Wow, that's amazing. <clears throat> Ken says uh, he hopes the idea of establishing tow detours spreads to other parts of the country and the world. I actually think it has, right? There are other similar projects around. Um, yeah, I think um, projects like this got started earlier, especially with uh, salamanders, spotted salamanders. And um, there are also some parts of the world, <clears throat> not as many in the US yet, where um, they've made deliberate types of bridges or tunnels for amphibians and other wildlife. Right. Do toads have toenails that they use for uh, burrowing in the ground in the winter? They don't have toenails. They have, um, they're, the back of their feet are pretty sturdy, but um, there's another toad or thing called a toad. It's in a different family, the spadefoot toad, which you can find in Southern New Jersey, although they're very difficult to find because they live most of their life underground and they have a little nail-like protrusion on the back of their leg, the back of their foot to, that's the spade foot, to dig into the soil a lot faster than the American toad. What percentage of eggs survives, asked Tracy? It was a small yeah. percent, right? A small percent makes it to adulthood. Yeah. You might get a pretty good hatch, but then, um, there's quite a bit of mortality on the way to toadlet them right. and beyond. Um, Ed is here. Ed actually is one of our stalwart toad detour volunteers. So Ed, thank you. Really appreciate your work you've done over the years. He's observed male toads mistakenly grab females and he hears the release call from the female. Um, well, you say mistakenly grab females. Uh, yeah, <laughs> or she's not interested at that moment. <laughs> she may not be interested. Um, but she's like, uh, I have, I have a road to cross. Leave me alone. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, <laughs> we've actually you've seen them cross. They have a photograph of them crossing the road. Um, but the the male has found his female, and he's right. You know, he he makes her drag her across the street. And yeah, up he, into he, the reservoir. And up up that steep hill. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm going to look for that too. Um, do the females vocalize as well? Uh, no, well, no, they don't um, sing like the males do. They, they may be able to chirp a little bit, but yeah, that, I, that get off me. You don't. I'm not familiar with any female vocalizations. Right. <laughs> Joan says, "Do toads eat Chinese food?" Just kidding. There we go. <laughs> Who eats tadpoles? The answer is so many things. Oh yeah. You want to give us a short list or it's a long list? The, the toad tadpoles are toxic to some animals, ah. um, but there are quite a few fish that will eat them. Um, and uh, water snakes probably eat them. Um, oh, a lot of insects like dragonfly larvae, uh, water beetles, and they're able to just pierce through the skin so they don't, uh, they don't have to eat the toxic skin. Uh. Yeah, the young stage of a dragonfly lives underwater and it like stalks things and it's got a, uh, its lower lip has like an arm and it grabs things. So it's, yeah, they're, they're tadpole stalkers. Yeah. Scott wants to know how we volunteer for the detour. Thank you, Scott. Is there an email or text alert? Um, I don't believe so. That'll be in the orientation, but I believe if you go to the Toad Detour Facebook page, we put the note up. Um, Ed, you probably know that. Um, um, you can Ed, Ed can chime in on the uh, on the on the chat, but um, I believe when they're when the toads are running, we get a message on Facebook, and so you check Facebook, and then you, you know to do that. Um, or you can actually, if it's your if you've signed up for that day, you go to Facebook to see if there's any action happening or not. We send we tend to send advanced scouts out to see how it's going. Uh, oh, Ed meant sorry, he meant the male toad grabbing a male toad, and the male oh, yeah. makes the release. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Joan says, who eats the eggs, the toad eggs? Um, newts will eat the toad eggs. So red spotted newts, um, there, there are red spotted newts in the, um, I've seen them in the wet, wetland pond. Yeah. What do you call the one down on the, in the ravine there? We call it wetland pond, yeah. Wetland pond, yeah. We're a little redundant, but yeah. But I haven't <laughs> seen them. Have you seen them in the other ponds? Um, great question. Amanda, have you seen newts in other ponds? 
I've never seen the toads in Wetland Pond. I wonder if we've seen them in the big one in, in um, Wind Dance. I haven't personally. It's not to say they're not there. I haven't seen them. Um, yeah, but yeah. again, not to say they're not there. Yeah. Yeah. We need Eduardo from our staff here. He's our official amphibian guy on our staff. He, uh -huh. would, know. he would know that. Um, Amanda put the registration up there uh, in the chat. That's great. Um, so we actually have two waves of toad detour. So we have the first wave where the, the volunteers go and help the toads cross to get into the reservoir. And then we have the second wave where the toadlets uh, come back uh, into the forest. Um, they leave, uh, and there seems to be a little bit of a wave there. Is there. Anything you want to say about that, Doug, while we're on that? Yeah, topic? so it's about um, seven or eight weeks between um, between waves. So they, they take about six, seven, eight weeks to develop as into toadlets. And then masses of them will cross. They're so tiny, it's, it's difficult to see them at night. And um, so th there's no way that you could carry them all across the road, you really need to block off the road. So yeah, um, that's what, what we do. Um, I was once driving to get lunch at noon and it was sunny and it looked like crickets were oh, on the oh. road. And it was like, it was the toads in the middle of the day in the sun, it made no sense, but there they were. Yeah, We can't close the road down at that time. Yeah. <laughs> and that was actually, it was in front of the baseball field. So we, we can't even close the road there. Oh, yeah. That's Allison says, I'm sorry, what's the typical path of toads from the nature center to the reservoir? Yeah, they, they concentrate on the, the Port Royal Hagee's Mill corner. Um, although, so from Port Royal down uh, to Eva is where most of the toads cross. Um, but we get some on the Eva, on the church side, coming in from there as well. Um, and we do get some up by the ball fields, surprisingly. So, but most of them tend to be concentrated. Um, um, Rich also sees the toadless crossing during the day, but usually after it rains. Yeah. Good, good. Um, yeah, so the, the typical path is from, is um, at that port or corner. Terry says, we've gone at dusk and rescued hundreds of tiny toadless as they came down the ramp by the baseball fields. There we go. <laughs> That's great. Um, it's a, sort of a, a bigger question. Amphibians have been having trouble uh, around the world. Do you have a sense of how the American toad is doing as a species in general? Uh, fortunately, what's happening with amphibians toad, in specific? Go ahead. I don't know if they're resistant to the fungus that's plagued so many amphibians, but um, they, they seem to be doing pretty well um, overall. In fact, the, the fact that they um, are relatively speaking, uh, abundant in, in parts of Philadelphia speaks to that. Um, so they're much more tolerant than other species. Um, you know, we've lost several species of frogs um, that, are, that should be native to this area that, that we don't have, things like spring peepers and gray tree frogs. Um, but the toads um, can hang on as long as they have a place to breed and um, not too much traffic. Um, right. Yeah. So the toads are hanging in there, but amphibians other, other places are in trouble. <laughs> Allison says, any chance toads would eat lantern flies? Uh, <laughs> um, that's a good question. They're kind of big or anything but a big female toad, but um, it would be interesting to see. They don't really, well, you know, the toads have dispersed into the woods by the time the lantern flies come out and um, or the big ones come out. So yeah. it would be interesting to know. It would be great if they did. But if you find a toad in your garden, that's a good thing, right? Definitely. You want toads in your garden. They eat hundreds of, of insects. So. There you go. So tell us about your photography. Um, so with the tadpoles, you actually, you had them in an aquarium. So you were, you, yeah. they were I kind of the, controlled I for I built a, a little aquarium that was kind of thin so that I, I could get um, close to them and use close-up lenses to get them. Um, so I, 
I raised them so that I could see all the different stages and get those very close up shots um, to show each, each phase. So I'm using yeah. a macro lens and flashes, um, holding the flash over the, the tank and, and getting the pictures that way. But then in the, in the wild, you've got some amazingly close up shots of some of the adult toads. Are you, do they let you get close or? Are you... Oh yeah. Um, if they're busy doing whatever they're doing, they can be pretty tolerant of, of people. So when their males are calling after, um, as the season progresses, they, they're they pretty stubborn and they'll just sit there and call, if, assuming you're relatively discreet. And uh, the breeding ones I got where, where they're actually laying eggs. I was out at night um, in, along the Wissahickon on one of those side, um, kind of shallow areas. And they were busy laying eggs. They weren't going to let me stop them just because I had a flashlight and, and flashes going. Right. Well, that's great. great. Um, what kind of camera do you use? I have a Canon. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had it here. Um, it's a Canon. Um, uh, I always forget the number. Yep. It's our, anyway, it, it's a full 50 me megapixel camera um, with a, typically I'm either using a hundred millimeter macro lens or a macro lens that'll allow me to uh, get between one, one times life size to five times life size. And, uh, so I can get a picture of the toe's eye or something like that. Right, right, right. Yeah, the, the detail in your photographs were just wonderful to see. How did the toes learn to travel to the old reservoir to propagate? Do they smell the water? How do they know? That's an excellent question. I don't know how they learn at first. Probably some toad has wandered up there and starts singing by the reservoir. The other toads hear them or they're... Uh, there, now there's a lot of good habitat up in the reservoir basin there now. So it's quite possible there are toads that actually live up there. Right. And um, the other toads may hear right. them sing. Right. And my assumption is lots of them are hybriding in the Schuylkill Center's big forest. So our forest is kind of where they are during the winter. And then when they wake up, they, they smell the water and they want to go. Actually, some of them then go in the other direction because they go to the other ponds on our property. But if they're in the forest closer to the reservoir, they seem to, they seem, they tend to want to go in that direction. Yeah. Yep. Um, so there's a question about whether they eat slugs. And um, Ed answered, yes, toads eat slugs. They eat anything they can get in their mouth, as you said, right? So they'll eat slugs. Yeah. Was the aquarium small so they couldn't roam too far from your camera? Was that the intent? Right. That, that was the idea. <laughs> <laughs> and they... Except that one did. <laughs> yeah, he found the one spot that he could go. <laughs> Do toads typically mate in the spot where they were born? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't seen any research that's, that's been able to prove that. It's very difficult to track a toadlet. Right. Given this, their size, you can't really put a tracking device on them, as far as I know. That's a great question. So it's not quite like they're salmon. They have to go back to where they, where they yeah. you know, spawned. That's, but that's a great, that's a great question. Yeah. Wow. You could probably uh, do something with DNA and figure it out now, but um, I haven't seen the answer to that. That's great. Well, Doug, thank you so much for your time and thank you for the wonderful photography and sharing the story with us. Well, thanks, Mike. I really appreciate it. And it's, um, it's been real fun speaking great. to all of you. Thank you, Doug Wexler, um, wonderful photographer, children's book author, naturalist, Hidden Life of the Toad is behind him, uh, over his shoulder, and several of your other books are, are there as well. <laughs> yeah, in our gift shop, come to this Google Center gift shop and get your own copy. <laughs> um, get your Chinese food, listen to them. Uh, that's a great thing to do. Uh, it's a treat and uh, go to Toad Detour and help us out. Uh, thank you to Ed, our Toad Detour Master. Thank you to Claire for running the, that program for so many years. Um, and uh, thank you to Amanda for helping us with Zoom tonight. Thank you all. Next week, 
uh, Six Legs to Rule Them All, all about insects. Um, so with Isa Betancourt, come join us next week. And in two weeks, uh, Spring Wildflowers. So, so we'll be here every Thursday at seven o'clock uh, into June. So thank you all. Have a great, great night. Again, thank you, Doug. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Amanda. Okay. Good night. Good night, everybody.